Abstraction using the new Pico SDK library for the status LED makes things easy to get going for beginners and faster to write portable code for experienced hands like me. It does have its dangers though, and Raspberry Pi with this brilliant first version have actually demonstrated them quite well. Let me explain. Hi, I'm John, your concierge to the world of the Raspberry Pi Pico, Pico 2 Robotics, IoT, and other fun tech. Remember to subscribe and join the community. So the status LED is the little onboard LED on the Pico, Pico W, Pico 2, and Pico 2W plus on some other, other third-party RP2040 and RP2350 boards too, including the RP2040 Zero that I'm gonna have a little look at in this video too. They are used to show things like comms being connected or just to blink to show that actually everything is working okay. And they're very useful too. If you like this video and it helps your learning or projects, why not drop me a cash tip using that super thanks button that's below the video, or alternatively, there's a payment link in the description. And please hit that like button on the video and subscribe for more. This video is sponsored by Wolf SSL. If you're just starting your coding journey, let me introduce you to a name you'll want to remember, Wolf SSL. It's not just a set of libraries, but a backpack full of quality tools and Wolf SSL packs some serious gear, encryption, authentication, secure connections, I could go on. What sets Wolf SSL apart? It's purpose-built for embedded systems and resource-limited environments. It's used in millions of devices worldwide, from aerospace and automotive to consumer electronics. If you're dreaming of building something that actually ships, this is the kind of library that gets your project battle-ready. Wolf SSL isn't just powerful, it's friendly. The docs are clear, the APIs are simple, and there's support, actually helpful support. And yes, it's open source too, with commercial support available if you want to go pro. So whatever you are building, Wolf SSL helps you write secure code like a pro. So start right, start smart, hit the link, grab Wolf SSL, and put some real security into your project. Because what you build matters, and how you protect it matters even more. So growing up with the Pico and Pico W, what we've sort of been taught to do is to use this approach to flash an LED. And to understand that, you know, the LED on a Pico is just a special GPIO pin. So what we need to know is know what that GPIO number is, and uh, it's defined by uh, this uh, definition in our, our um, application, the Pico default LED pin, which comes in from the Pico standard library. And then we need to initialize that as a GPIO line and set it to be an output. And then when we drive it high, we will turn the LED on, and we drive it low, we will turn the LED off. So that you know, that's really relatively simple and starts introducing you to how GPIO lines are managed and what they, how they work and things. And that was, when the Pico first came out, that was really interesting and useful and a great way of starting your journey into programming for the Pico. Then of course we had the Pico W launch. And things got a little bit more difficult because the problem with the Pico W for our friends at Raspberry Pi as they designed it is they used too many of the uh, GPIO pins coming out of the RP2040 chip already and they were sort of short of one to be able to control this CYW43 chip that was going to provide the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth connectivity. So they needed to regain one. So what they did, which makes absolute sense, is you move the LED to use one of the GPIO ports off of the actual CYW43 chip. So that Wi-Fi chip, because that Wi-Fi chip's got three um, uh, GPIO lines coming out of it too. So you could just move the LED to there and then we are always just use that uh, peripheral or, uh, to control the LED. So that means that the code kind of looks rather different because now we're going to have to bring in the CW, CYW43's architecture and, and that chip definition. We've got to initialize that chip 
and then we've got to actually ask that chip by sending actually messages across for it to turn on the LED. So instead of directly controlling a GPIO port, we're now using a library. We're now uh, connecting to that another chip, sending it a message and asking it to then do something, which is a very different way to flashing an LED. And that I think can create some problems and it makes trying to write code that is consistent across both of these things really, really difficult to do. So if I wanted to write a version of Blink that will run on both a Pico and a Pico W, or indeed actually a Pico 2 and a Pico 2 W for that matter, um, I, well, this is what you sort of end up with. And this is Raspberry Pi's own version of this code. And you see, well, first of all, we've got to make a decision of, are we actually going to include that, that CYW43 uh, um, include file? Because if we're on a Pico, we can't. It doesn't exist and it's not available for us. So we have to uh, put that within a hash if def block. And then we're going to have to do hash if def blocks around the initialization and how we initialize the two LED strategies because they're different. And then uh, how we're actually turning the LEDs on and off. Um, and they've broken those out in functions in order that actually the main function and loop looks actually somewhat sensible. But really the amount of hash ifs we're getting into this code is just uh, massive and it starts to get problematic. Um, uh, it's, it's not easy to read, um, it's not easy to understand, and it's not easy to explain to other people. So that's why actually this change with the Pico SDK 2.2.0 is so, so important. So to use the status LED library, first of all, you know, um, I've got this example here, which is built for a Pico. So it's really all about this line here that we put in the top level make file of what the target board is. And that's actually what's going to allow the library to adapt to the different board types. So I've actually forced this in to say that the Pico board, uh, it, it board is the target board for this particular project. And I'll show you in a second how I'm going to change that to other boards. So we're going to use a library. So in my uh, subordinate uh, CMake list file, I'm going to tell it that I'm going to use the Pico status LED library. And we've just got a single main function here. So what main's going to do this time is we're going to include uh, the header file for our status LED. And then we need to initialize our status LED. And I'm just going to use a hard assert to check that the LED did initialize. Because you could make an, uh, an a Pico or an RP2040 board without a status LED on at all, in which case we sort of want to know it hasn't initialized and it's not working properly. And then our loop, basically we are going to keep using the status LED set state to turn it on and turn it off. And that's really it. Um, oh yes, you can also de-initialize uh, the LED. Not that we're ever going to get to that line. So this code will work and allow us to flash uh, the LED on a Pico. It will also allow us to flash that LED in exactly the same code on a Pico W. Let me show you that. And to demonstrate this, I'm going to be a little bit clever and write a project here that actually includes no source code in it. Because uh, I'm going to, first of all, set the board now to be a Pico W board in our CMake list start file. And I'm not going to bother in writing the source code here. I'm actually going to go and include it from the status LED blink project that we just looked at that was building for a Pico. So now, because I've told it I'm building for a Pico W and I'm including that source folder, we'll actually go and build that code for the Pico W. Now, 
normally when you see me use the add sub um, directory command you'll see that I actually only give it the uh, single parameter of source. When you uh, add a uh, directory that is not in within your current folder structure, you actually have to tell it where the binaries are to be built from that project should be located. And that's what that second parameter is doing there. And that just puts it into the same structure as we were building previously. But yeah, so this now builds it and we now can blink the LED perfectly on a Pico W without changing a single line of the C source code. Now this little beast here is a WaveShare RP2040. So it's a different form factor and slightly different designed RP2040 board. I use them quite a bit because they're about half the size of a Pico and I quite like them. They also, depending on where you're buying them from, can be cheaper than Picos to buy. So now we can now set up Blink to run on this. And to get Blink to run on this, all I need to do, strangely, is change the Pico port definition and tell it that I'm using a WaveShare RP2040. And the code will then adapt to the new LED uh, strategy that's being used on this board. And that's it. It's really that easy. Now, in actual fact, a RP2040 doesn't use a traditional LED. And you saw that LED flashed white a second ago. Well, actually, this is a WS2812B LED, which is a RGB, red, green and blue LED. So we can make it flash in any color. It's also a serially connected LED. So it uses just a single data line in order to send a message to the LED to turn it on. Now, you'd normally see these in things like LED rings or LED strips. And I've used some of them in my other projects. You've uh, probably seen this uh, LED um, chasing ring that I did a while ago. Now, of course, using the status LED library, we don't need to worry about what the form factor is of this RP2040 because it's all taken care of us. Well, we do a little bit because we need to know that it's actually going to be a RGB LED and therefore we could actually change its color. So in this example, I'm going to use that capability and I'm going to say, let's set up a array of rainbow colors. And that's what I've just done here. And then we're going to have a loop and we're going to go through the color. And so instead of just turning the LED on, which will make it turn it on on white for this particular device, we can actually turn it to a particular color by using the color status LED set on with color. So that's great. So without worrying about what's on this board, how this board's working, what's going on, this library just takes all of the problems away from us and we can have our LED go through all of the colors of the rainbow. Can't we? Well, here it is running. And as you can see, uh, no, apparently we can't. And this is the an example of the danger of abstraction in these sorts of libraries is if you really don't understand what's going on and you or you haven't got an appreciation of what a library is doing, then you might stumble into little problems like this. Now, this problem here, I think, is a bug because this uh, it, the code as I've written it seems to work as far as I can see exactly as the documentation for the API says it should. But as you can see, it doesn't work and it isn't working. Now, why is that? Well, that's when you actually do need to understand a little bit more about what's going on in this abstraction layer. How is this really working on the hardware? And what is that hardware and it doing with this LED? So I had to dig in a little bit more to are how this library is driving this WS2812B LED to understand how I might fix this problem. And by fix, I mean workaround, because to be honest, I think this is a bug. So I am absolutely working around this, but 
bugs happen, especially in first releases of libraries, and that's what this is. So to get around this problem and to make our LED actually go through the colors of the rainbow, firstly, we need to turn it off because it doesn't look like the LED is actually going to work properly unless we're, it's off before we actually set its color. Okay, we can do that. So we can turn it off. Oh, and if you send off and then set its color immediately after, actually you're going to send the protocol out without the right amount of gap in between, which means that it will uh, ignore the turn on add to color command. So we're gonna to have to put a little bit of a break of 200 microseconds. It should actually only need 50 microseconds, but anyway, according to the protocol, but I, I've put it 200 because that seemed to be more stable. Um, and yes, so a, a 200 microsecond delay between these two commands. So we need to turn it off, wait 200 microseconds, which is no time at all in, in, in human terms and then turn it on to the particular color. And then we can cycle through the rainbow. And that, you see, now actually works. But I could only do this because I had an appreciation for how this LED on this board was configured, and indeed what you needed to then do to actually work with that LED. So although I think abstraction is really, really useful, um, it does have its dangers and you do still need to be a little bit aware of what that code should be doing on your device. Actually, there's a little bit more to be aware of here as well. So I've jumped into the Pico SDK code itself as they ship. Um, and let's have a quick look at how this um, new library is actually being written for us. So let me find the library. So here we go. So it's a, uh, an RP2 common library, Pico status LED. Now, the first thing that jumps out of me as soon as I look at this library is this file here. Because you see to drive WS2812B LEDs like on our RP2040, it's actually using the PIO capability. And that means that one of the PIO channels uh, is being loaded on our RP2040 to drive that. And one of those um, uh, state machines is being used. Now you only have eight uh, slots for these uh, programs or state machine slots on an RP2040. You actually have uh, 12 on an RP2350, but you need to know which one you've used because obviously you can't reuse it then in your own code. So this abstraction has also taken away uh, visibility from the fact that actually we've got some PIO running here and it's running on a particular um, one of our state machines. So again, just be aware of what's going on here and that there are some things happening. If you're not aware of it, you nasty things may happen and your code may fail to work. So it, it's, again, uh, about just being aware that there are other things going on as well and that abstraction is useful as an accelerator, but you still have to be sort of aware of what it might be doing. Abstraction is great, and this new library, even with a little tiny bug in it, is a welcome treat in the new version of the SDK. I can certainly take less notice of how the status LED is connected in my projects, but not no notice. Otherwise, I'm gonna risk uh, interactions appearing between libraries or functions in my code, or finding little bugs like we found in this video. If this video helps you out or sparks some ideas for your own projects, consider supporting me with that super thanks button below the video or the payment link for tips in the description. This helps me keep the lights on and new videos coming. Thank you again for watching. If you enjoyed this, give me a thumbs up and make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the next video. And if you want more ideas with LEDs, then check out this video here. See you on the next video. Bye bye.